Good morning. Welcome to First Unitarian Universalist Very Virtual Christmas Service. I am the Reverend Sherman Z. Logan Jr. and I have the honor, privilege of serving this wonderful congregation as its senior minister. I want to extend a special welcome this morning from wherever you may be watching, at home in your robe and your PJs, sitting beside your cozy fireplace, or at the kitchen table enjoying your first cup of coffee. And if you are joining us for the first time, visiting from other places, or well, if you do not worship with us regularly, we are so thankful that you're here with us today, and we are excited to celebrate Christmas with you. At this special and sacred time of year, I wish to extend to you and your loved one holiday greetings and best wishes for the new year. Let us join together in the spirit of Christmas to stir into hope the vision of trust and justice all over the world and that peace and goodwill may bless and keep us in every generation. Welcome all of you to our worship service. Our child sliding this morning is by Charles A. Howe. O thou whose power we see in the stars and whose presence we experience as love, may we today be sustained by that power and open to that love. Amen. Welcome all and again, Merry Christmas Sunday. I am the Reverend Lauren Levwood, and I'm pleased to serve this congregation as one of your assistant ministers. Wherever you are, whether snuggled at home or traveling near or far, welcome to today's virtual Christmas service. Christmas is a time of wonder. It's a time rich with lore and magical rituals that create suspense and awe for children and the child at heart. On this Christmas Sunday, I want to invite you to receive an offering. This is an invitation to crack open your heart to the gift of wonder. Some gifts are tangible and some can only be felt by the soul. May your soul seek the experience of wonder and in so doing, may you unwrap that holiest gift, the gift of your own heart. Today we remember an ancient biblical love story, the story of two people who traveled a long way ripe with child, the story of a baby who was destined to change the world, and the community who cared for all of them. Ancient stories speak to us in modern times because they still resonate today, otherwise they would be forgotten. We are all traveling through some sort of night, companioned by those closest to us, ripe with something waiting to be born. In that spirit, let us sing together our opening carol, What Child Is This? child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping. This, this is Christ the King who shepherds God. Taste to bring him 
Our first reading is Calling by Nancy Schaefer. When you heard that voice and knew finally it had called for you and what it was saying, where were you? Were you in the shower, wet and soapy, or chopping cabbage late for dinner? Were you planting radish seeds or soaking one lost sock? Maybe wiping handprints off a window or coaxing words into a sentence. Maybe coming upon a hyacinth or one last no. Where were you when you heard that ancient voice? And did yes get born right then? And did you weep? Had it called you since before you even were? And when you knew that, did your joy escape all holding? Where were you when you heard that calling voice? And how in that moment did you mark it? How ever after are you changed? Tell us, please, all you can about that voice. Teach us how to listen, how to hear. Teach us all you can of saying yes. I invite you now to close your eyes and bring your awareness to your breath for a moment of silent meditation. Let us pray. Spirit of life and love, thank you. Thank you for this day. We pray now in the words of Howard Thurman. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. May our hearts be tuned to the frequency of love May we remember these words and be inspired to heed them today and every day. Amen. And now please join in singing our carol for meditation, O Come, Emmanuel. Give comfort to all that 
If only I could give you the gift of adventure. If only I could box her up for you, that big red bow on top glimmering. But this cannot be. Adventure is not given or earned. She is a breath that is prayed, a force that is found, found in the soul of everyone and everything. But maybe, just maybe, if I cannot box her up for you, I can at least point you in her direction. Maybe, at least I can tell you where I saw her last, what I prayed when I was alone, waiting in the forest under the pine tree, waiting for her to appear. Maybe that would be your beginning. You see, I didn't learn for a long time. For years, as soon as I began searching, I hid behind fear, and all the while, adventure waiting for me, with liner and a wildflower. At that time, I only wanted pictures of her, without knowing her presence, her warmth, her smell. But when I met her, I found myself. When I prayed, I found God. If only I could teach you not to be afraid. If only I could tell you that it's okay if you don't have words left to pray. If only I could point you towards that lantern and that wildflower. If only I could show you the way of God. But God cannot be given or earned. No God is found. So, in that, so in, that, in that soul of yours, there's the greatest opportunity. You, the world, breath and prayer and body, everything sacred. These things would never fit into a box with a big red bow on top glimmering. What gift does your soul long for? What does the heart of our community call out for this Christmas? What gift won't fit in any box, yet the shine of it, the beacon and need for it, calls out to you, to us, this year? If only I could give you the gift of adventure, Caitlin Curtis writes, but adventure and so many gifts of the spirit cannot be bought or borrowed. Adventure is a breath that is prayed, a force that is found, found in the soul of everyone and everything. As we move through this deep winter season, Christians spend time reflecting during a period of Advent this time of year. Advent means waiting, waiting for a special person, a very important figure to arrive. Advent comes from the Latin root adventus, or arrival, and shares a similar origin with the word adventure, which comes from adventurus, signifying that something is about to happen. Both of these words come from the root word advenir, meaning to come, to come round the corner to something new, a new experience, or to invite a new person into our lives. This congregation has been through such a long, long period of Advent this year. It started well before December. Am I right? We have spent the entirety of 2022 waiting for a special person, for our next senior minister to be called. And now he has been. And I'd like to say congratulations, Reverend Sherman Z. Logan Jr., for receiving such dramatic support and welcome from this congregation to be our new senior minister. Now, this community, we can start a new adventure together. Adventure, as Curtis reminds us, can't be handed over in a box with a big red bow on top glimmering. 
but true adventure does glimmer. It calls out to us from the depths of our secret longings. It speaks from the voice of the heart and says, here, this is what is true. See it, know it, own it. Seek it and keep seeking it. Adventure for some may be found on that far off peak of a mountain, but that is only because the external hike up the metaphorical hill serves as an aid to distance us from the familiar and make space for what is truly an internal journey of the spirit. Whether found on a mountaintop or in our own living rooms, the true essence of adventure is always accompanied by an inner call. Maybe, Curtis writes, maybe I can tell you where I saw her last, what I prayed when I was alone, waiting in a forest under the pine trees, waiting for her to appear. Maybe that will be your beginning. Or maybe your beginning, your entry to self-discovery will happen another way. In a coffee shop with a dusty journal you've decided to write in for the first time. On a dance floor in a concert hall or alone with a ukulele in your kitchen. Between the knit and pearl of your knitting needles in the space between breaths while you wait for sleep but wherever the advent of your personal adventure awaits you, remember this. You aren't actually alone. You are part of a larger cosmos. You are a facet in the great web of creation, and you belong here. While the inner journey can open us to truth, while prayer and realization often happen in a solitary way, community, community is essential to our collective adventure, and we find that by climbing that metaphorical mountain or praying under trees together. Today being Christmas, some of us gather around a festive tree to exchange gifts, enjoy holiday foods, spend time together. Some of us celebrate the solstice and the dark of winter passing into the coming of new light. Some of us reflect on the birth of Jesus, whose birth is remembered in pageants and represented by nativity scenes. That ancient story goes that Jesus was born in a stable because there wasn't any room for him in the inn. What an adventure, am I right? Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, rejected by human community, but welcomed by humble beasts. Jesus was born in a barn and laid in a bed of straw with cattle lowing nearby. But what if that story was different? Quote, I'm sorry to spoil your Christmas, Reverend Ian Paul, theologian and religious scholar, writes. But Jesus wasn't born in a stable. And curiously, the New Testament hardly even hints that this might have been the case. Isn't it interesting, by the way, what stories we perpetuate that maybe aren't so? Reverend Paul is not the only scholar to note this deviation from the common interpretation of the Christmas story. In fact, Spaniard Francisco Sanchez de la Brazas shared this observation with the world in 1583, and he was denounced for it. It has been repeatedly mentioned by Greek scholars in the years hence. For hundreds of years, people have been trying to tell us that this isn't an accurate interpretation of the biblical text. So if Jesus' parents were not dejected by community and sent to a barn for Mary to give birth, what did the ancient story actually say? What does the Greek actually mean? 
The Greek word usually mistranslated as in, kataluma, in fact, means the reception room or upper room of a private house. This, by the way, is the exact same word for upper room that was used for the room where Jesus had his last supper and was translated as such in that part of the text. So if Mary and Joseph had journeyed to Bethlehem for the census on account of Joseph's having family there, then first century Palestinian culture would have required that they stay with relatives. They weren't in a foreign land where they knew no one. They weren't strangers at an inn. The Greek word for inn, by the way, would have been appropriately pandachion, which would have meant a place with strangers, but that's not the word that was used. It was kataluma, upper room. Instead, the ancient story tells us that Joseph and Mary arrived at his relative's house, his family's house, and found the upper room to be already brimming, full of people, full of his family. So they retreated naturally to a more private space where privacy, warmth, and peace was able to support them during her labor and birth of their child to the lower room where family typically kept their animals at night. They were treated not in spite of her being pregnant, but actually because of it. Her pregnancy, labor, and birth were respected and honored. She and they were held in a community of care. Reverend Paul writes, the actual design of Palestinian homes, even to the present day, makes sense of the whole story. Most families would live in a single room house with a lower compartment for animals brought in at night and either a room in the back for visitors or space on the roof. The family living area would usually have hollows in the ground filled with straw where animals would feed. So, friends, what new meaning does this shift in the Christmas story teach us about the spirit of adventure? You see, whether we connect personally with this ancient story or not, this is such a large, impactful story in our collective consciousness that it deserves us reckoning with. What happens for you when you change that narrative and no longer imagine a story that glorifies a babe born to a dejected mother rising from the ashes of this rejection in a cold, lonely barn, but instead tells the story of a Palestinian community living in a beautiful expression of togetherness, a house so full there was no space for privacy in the main upper room, so a space was carved out with care for a pregnant woman to labor after a very long walk that landed this couple safely into a family home. What might it mean if long before the three kings arrived to bring expensive material gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we add to the story the women who heated the water and brought wet cloths to Mary, who cared for Mary and her baby, who comforted Joseph, who helped deliver the placenta, who taught Mary and Jesus to nurse, a vision of community, of care. What might it mean if we open our imaginations to creating this story, this vision of care? What it, might it mean if we open our imaginations to a story that cares for mothers and all birthing people rather than rejects them and sends them off into the night alone to labor in the darkness? What might it mean if this story of community care became our idea of adventure? If adventure wasn't something to seek alone, but to create together. Join me in a moment of prayer. 
Spirit of life and love, be with us today as we unravel old stories and weave new wisdom. Open our ears to hear the voices of the margins that speak of ways we might dream things differently. Help us to remember that traditions were once born as new things and that traditions can change as we can change. And new ones are born all the time. Teach us to change together in harmonious and empowering ways. Urge us to widen our circle and expand our hearts and minds. Thank you for the gift of life and life's opportunity to lean into greater and greater love together. Amen. And now let us join in singing our closing carol, We Three Kings, as we reimagine what stars of wonder might guide us and remember that the gift of spirit woven in love is the greatest gift of all. When stars align, bright in the cold night air, whether they be stars of the outer atmosphere or the inner stars of the heart, let us take pause. Let us celebrate that our hearts are beating, that humanity over time and space has proven the power of love over and over again, that everyday miracles are possible. Writer Jeanette Winterson reminds us of the physics of love, the probability of separate worlds meeting is very small, she says. The probability of our collective stars aligning is so small, and yet, and yet, she writes, the lure of it is immense. And so we send starships, we fall in love. May we send starships into the coming year as the days grow long again, may we write love letters in the galaxies of the heart. May we rise up for justice. May we sink down into authenticity. May we reach for one another. May we resist the pull of too much and allow our soft bodies gentleness and sacred rest. May we receive what we need. And if we don't, may we seek it and find it. May we pay attention to the needs of others. May we listen first, 
May being precede doing. And may this community, knit starship to starship, find its way in the world, bound together by love. Amen, 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 ashe, and blessed be. And Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas.